I'm Jason Lee EMU, and this talk will be on Faster Parallel Algorithm for Approximate Shortest Path to appear in Stock 2020. In this talk, we'll be considering the approximate SSSP problem, which is given an undirected graph with non-negative weights and a source vertex S, we want to output approximate distances from S to all the vertices in the graph. Alternatively, we can ask for a approximate shortest path tree, which is a tree whose distances on the tree from S to each vertex V approximates the true distance from S to V in the original graph. Now, historically, these two problems have, have been uh, have been of a similar difficulty in a sense that algorithms that can solve one of the two can tend to be able to solve the other one as well. This will be the case in our result for the approximate shortest path problem. So for sim simplicity of this talk, we'll be only considering the distances problem. So we just want to output some approximate distances. The computation model in this talk, said, in this talk will be the, the parallel PRM model, which you can think of as identical to the sequential model, except that there's an additional uh, parallel for each loop, which takes in a set, in a set of iterations and runs each loop, loop iteration independently in parallel. So they must not depend on each other. And we can define work and span or time in a traditional sense, where span is a, where work is the sum of running times and span is the max running time over, within each for each. So this, this uh, problem in the parallel setting has seen a lot of work in the past. One well-known result is Cohen result, uh, which essentially shows that, uh, which shows that uh, the approximate SSP problem in parallel can be solved essentially optimally. To prove the result, Cohen introduced the concept of hop sets, which are edges that shortcut the graph in order to, ma to make the shortest path, to make an approximate shortest path from S to any vertex V contain only a small number of edges. This ensures that uh, a Bellman-Ford Bellman algorithm, uh, this ensures that uh, it only takes a few steps of Bellman-Ford before all the distances are approximate. Uh, this this Hofstede-based algorithm has been improved recently by Elkin and Neiman, but it still runs in m to the 1 plus delta time, the delta work. So it's still open. Until now, it was still open whether there's a, there's a parallel algorithm that runs in m polylogon work and polylogon time, which is important because this is this is usually what we think of when we consider a truly work efficient algorithm. But it's polylog within polylog factors of optimal. So it turns out why is the, this problem be open for so long? So long, one uh, one potential answer is that. Perhaps surprisingly, there's a lower bound graph that essentially rules out all hopset based algorithms in a sense that there's some specific lower bound graph for which any hopset on this graph with, let's say, polylogarithmic hop bound in a sense that any shortest, a shortest path, an approximate shortest path needs to take, needs to have at most a polylog number of edges. Any such graph, any such hopset needs more than m polylog and edges. And therefore, there's, it's impossible to only use hop sets to solve this problem. So our result is we bypass the hop set barrier by tackling this problem from a completely new direction, from the, from the direction of continuous optimization, which has seen a lot of recent success in similar problems like max flow, like approximate max flow. So in our setting, we want to, in order to employ continuous optimization, we would like some kind of continuous relaxation of the SSSP problem. And here it turns out the minimum transshipment problem, otherwise known as undirect, uh, uh, no, otherwise, otherwise known as uncapacitated min cost flow, is a good choice for us. And concurrently, in the same stock, Andoni, Stein, and Jung have obtained a, a similar result, essentially the same result, with similar techniques. They also consider continuous optimization and transshipment problem. Let's begin with the transshipment problem, otherwise known as uncapacitated min cost flow. So as input, we are given a graph with, let's say, the vertex edge, vertex edge instance matrix, and some that captures the graph, and some, and some demand, demand vector 
whose demand sum to zero. So you think of this like a flow demand vector. Our flow constraint will be the, the standard one, where the flow can be thought of as a vector on the edges, and it will satisfy these, these flow, this flow constraint. And here, unlike max flow, where we want to minimize the maximum congestion, here we want to minimize some kind of L1 norm, where you can think of a C is the cost matrix, the diagonal matrix, where uh, diagonal matrix, where the, the diagonal entries are the cost of the edges. So essentially, we have the flow weighted by the costs, and we have an L1 norm. You think of this as the, the transshipment cost of the flow. You think of this as like a L1 version of max flow, because if the one were replaced by infinity, then this would be exactly the max flow. Now, why is this problem a relaxation of shortest path? Well, if you take the, this following demand vector, where S is the source, and you compute the optimal transshipment, then this, the optimal transshipment will necessarily send one unit for flow from S to each vertex V along the shortest SV path. Essentially because uh, the cost here, because of this demand vector, the cost can essentially be broken up into a flow from S to each vertex V. And you might as well send this, uh, this flow from S to each vertex V on the shortest S to V path. In other words, if we can solve, in other words, you, if, uh, if you can solve exact transshipment, then we also solve exact sequence of shortest path. Note that, however, this does not mean that approximate versions uh, gener uh, this no, no, this does not mean that the approximate versions of a transshipment uh, generalize the approximate SSV. Turns out this is not the case in general. However, uh, turns out uh, some kind of, this kind of reduction can be done in the sense that we can replace uh, if, with a more complicated reduction. We can reduce approximate SSV to some polyagonal many calls of approximate transshipment, and this this uh, direction has been studied has been studied by Becker, Forrester, Karenbauer, and Lenzin. Here we need we need to do a little bit more work to get the full reduction for our setting, but we essentially adapt their techniques to do it. Okay. To solve transshipment, we'll be following Sherman's framework from his original breakthrough paper on approximate max flow. So for max flow, what Sherman does is Sherman uh, reduces the approximate one plus epsilon approximate max flow to computing a polylogon approximate oblivious routing, which at first glance might seem like a harder problem because oblivious routing is like max flow without knowing the demands. But here the approximation factor only needs to be a polylogarithmic, so it's much more generous than the one plus epsilon. So Sherman's framework can, can be thought of as boosting a, a lossy polylog approximate oblivious routing to a finer 1 plus epsilon approximate max flow. So here, we do something very similar, which was also done in Sherman from 17. Um, we reduce uh, 1 plus epsilon approximate transshipment, think of this as the L1 version of max flow, to what is called a L1 oblivious routing, which you think of as the L1 version of tr traditional ob oblivious routing. So here, again, uh, where, where we do not know the demands, and we have to con construct a flow uh, fulfilling the demands. And here we're charged by not the max flow, not the max congestion, but by the the L1 cost, the total uh, the total length of the flows. So it turns out this reduction going from this problem to this problem can be interpreted using a multiple ways update kind of uh, approach. Sherman does not prove it initially this way, but we have a in our paper. Uh, we have a self-contained section that essentially reduces, uh, essentially treats this reduction um, with by with a multiple multiple ways update kind of approach. Okay, now so what is L L one oblivious routing? We'll define it more formally later on, but for now, uh, think of it as just like an L one version of a standard oblivious routing for max flow. And here, the main te our main te technical contribution in the entire paper is we solve L1 oblivious routing in near linear work and polylogon time, but given an initial L1 embedding of the graph. And we'll see next slide why an L1, L1 embedding makes the problem a lot more tractable.
instead of define actually so instead of defining the L1 of this round in general, we'll only be focusing on defining it for L1 metrics, which are metrics defined as points in say some like log n dimensions, where the distance between the points are is the L1 distance between the two points. So why are why are L1 buildings relevant? Well, there's a well-known uh, embed, embedding by Borgang, which shows that any graph can be embedded into, let's say, L2 distance uh, with a small number of dimensions and a small distortion. So nat naturally, under, under this small dimension, the L2 and L1 metrics are very close to each other. So we also get a very, uh, very fine, we get a poly polylog and distortion embedding in L1. Now, of course, it's not clear how to do this algorithm in parallel, because the algorithm itself will you will call a bunch of a single short, single source shortest path calls, um, which is the problem we're set up we're trying to solve in the first place. But more on this later. But if we can do this, then we essentially solve we essentially reduce the problem of solving L1 of this rounding to solving the problem on on an L1 metric. So we can assume that the initial graph is not a graph but a metric, a more general metric, where the distances between points are the L1 distances. And this essentially, what is nice about this is essentially reduces the problem to a purely geometric problem now. Instead of graphs and vertices and edges, we just have points in some low dimensional L1 space, some like log n dimensional L1 space. And we just want to think of like moving, we were thinking, we're, imagine, imagine we're like moving flow from point to point and we want to satisfy demands on the points. Okay. So for, at this point, we will, now we'll finally define what is an L1 and I believe is rounding in an L1 metric. I think this is more, this will capture more the intuition on what L1 and I believe is rounding is when it's defined on a specific L1 metric rather than an uh, original, rather than the entire graph, the, rather than the original graph. So here the input is a set of points and a demand function with demand sum to zero, whose demand sum to zero, that is unknown to us. It's un unknown to the algorithm, but it's known to us for the analysis perspective. On each step for the algorithm, the algorithm must choose any two points. Uh, let's say all the points are in an integer lattice, and a scalar function, and a scalar. So these are x, y, and c are choices the algorithm makes. And the algorithm essentially shifts, imagine shifting C times the demand at the current demand at X to lo location Y. So we imagine up making the following two simultaneous updates. Now the algorithm does not know uh, B of X because that's the current demand. But uh, we can, for the anal from the analysis perspective, we are making these updates and we're computing the total cost overall uh, throughout the algorithm, which is, which is, uh, which is uh, this function right here, this expression right here. Again, the algorithm does not know how much it pays in each iteration. Now, after some a few after some steps, the algorithm can can declare that it is done. It finishes. At this point, the algorithm must be certain that the demand is zero everywhere. The algorithm must process all the demands by this point. Now, once we are done, we calculate the total cost of uh, that the algorithm uh, makes, and we compare it to the optimal strategy had we known the set of demands beforehand. So you can think of this, this as like a uh, an online some kind of online problem where we're analyzing the competitive ratio of um, of knowing the cost beforehand versus not knowing the cost at all throughout the entire algorithm. And we want the competitive ratio to be, let's say, a polylog. And this will translate to a polylog in approximation. That's what we call a polylog in approximation. So why is this even possible? So here's some intuition on what an oblivious rounding algorithm might look like in, let's say, the, mo the most the simplest setting, which is just the one-dimensional setting. So let's imagine D is one. We're in a one-dimensional setting. and and here, as input, let's say there's a there's a one demand of five, and minus one demand of fourteen. So here's the one potential algorithm that, that can be done on on this on 
to this instance. So what the algorithm does is first, it takes every point, every odd coordinate, every point with odd coordinate, and splits and sets C to be one half and sends half the demand here to each of the even coordinates uh, beside it. Now this point is even, so this doesn't change. There's no demand being routed here. On the second iteration, it takes all the points whose uh, coordinate is 2 mod 4 and spreads half the demand to the multiples of 4 adjacent to it, and same similarly here. And then now we take the points with four, uh, 4 mod 8 and we spread it to points uh, the closest multiples of 8, uh, half and half again, and so on. And after log base 2 of the, the max coordinate will be done. At this point, we will declare that that algorithm finishes. And turns out this running can be shown to be like a, a log base 2 of n approximation, a log base 2 of max coordinate approximation. So some intuition we can get from that algorithm is that whatever oblivious routing algorithm we use, it should intuitively route the points uh, in an unbiased manner, in the sense that it should route it should split the points, it should route the points evenly from le uh, to left and right. In, in that case, we, out, we route the points half and half, so it is unbiased. And the reason is because we do not know the, the demand beforehand, so the best, our best bet is to split demands so that um, uh, to account for each case, whether the demand should be split sent to the left or the demand should be sent to the right. So Sherman's algorithm from 2017 actually generalizes the, the algorithm we just, show, we just showed um, to the general case of, of higher dimensions in the sense that instead of routing just left and right, he, he, uh, his algorithm routes to all the 2 to the corners of the cube that the point is in. Now, unfortunately, this incurs this 2 to d factor. So Sherman sets d to be square root log n, and he gets a, he gets a 2 to the square log n factor in the final running diagram. So how do we improve upon his algorithm? How do we get rid of this 2 to the square log n factor? So we employ a more randomized strategy. Instead of routing a point to all two of the corners of the cube, we route randomly up each point to some, not 2 to the d, but just poly log n many random points nearby. Now why, first of all, why poly log n random points, not just one random point? Well, we need to control the variance. We need the, we need the routing to be unbiased. So essentially, we want uh, once we route the bunch of uh, once we route the points, we want the average of the uh, the points where we route to to be close to the original average. So in other words, we want to control the variance and apply some concentration bound to show that the average of the final of the routed points is close to the original point. Now at the same time, we need to control the number of new points that we're routed to. Because we don't want some polylog and blow up in the number of new points on each level. So essentially, we want a lot of points, a lot of different vertices, different points to be routed to the same new point. We want these new points to kind of coalesce and they should agree among different points. And here, our technique will be to overlay, to, to um, consider the idea of randomly shift the grids, popular in computational geometry. So, what we do is um, we imagine overlaying a random grid on the graph. Now every point sends its demand, so let's, say, let's say a fraction, a 1 over polylog and fraction of its demand, to the center of the grid it's in. And now we do this for polylog and many grids. We overlay polylog and randomly shed the grids and do this for each, for each uh, point. And as long as the grid sideline is large enough in a sense that the sideline is, is, let's say, a polylog and time factor longer than the current scale, then the expected number of non-zero cells will be small. It will be roughly linear and will be in good shape. We will be bounding the number of new points. Okay, so so let's go back to the problem of um, Borgen's embedding. How, to, how do you do this L1 embedding? 
So Borgen's embedding actually it reduces to computing log squared n many exact single synchronous paths. Of course, the approximate SSP is a problem where um, we won't solve in the first place, so this is not good enough for us. What turns out that some sort of approximate SSP is sufficient. Borgen's if you if you just uh, a uh, sufficiently fine approximation for a shortest path will give you Borgen's embedding as well. Um, actually, the approximation, the approximate distances of the SSP need to satisfy some kind of triangle inequality constraint um, to make this fully work out. But our algorithm actually obtains this, this triangle inequality constraint for free, so we won't talk about it here. But the idea is we want to apply recursion somehow because. We want to solve a recursive SSP in order to apply Borgen's embedding to get an L1 embedding, and from there we solve uh, L1 with this routing and the transshipment, and that's finally SSP. So how do we make the recursion work out? Of course, we want the we want the recursion uh, the total size of the problems over the recursion levels to decrease over time. So there's still some some something uh, there's still some non-trivial steps to be made here. Um, in order to make sure that the recursion sizes do not blow up over recursion levels, we will be applying we will be applying uh, the technique of ultra sparsification. So first, what we do is we can compute what's called an ultra spanner of the graph. So think so the ultra spanner is like the the L1 version of ultra sparsifier, which are used in, in fast max flow algorithms. So here, an ultra spanner. Is a graph is a super sparse graph in the sense that it is a tree plus a very tiny amount of additional edges. And what we want is we want it to be a spanner in a sense that it should preserve distances in the original graph up to some polylog factor. And it turns out it suffices to embed L1 embed this ultra spanner. So first, given the graph, we first compute an ultra spanner, and then instead of embedding the original graph, we embed this ultra spanner. Now the ultra spanner is a polylog approximation. To the original graph, which means that if we L1 embed the ultra spanner instead, then we're picking up this extra polylog in the distortion, but it's still a polylog in factor, which is which is fine for our case. Finally, we, we solve SSP on this ultra spanner. Magically, this turns out to be this to be uh, reducible to solving SSP on a graph of size uh, the number of non-tree edges. So why is this kind of reduction believable? Well, in the extreme case where this is zero, the graph is just a tree itself, well, SSSP on a tree is easy. We can even solve it exactly very easily. Now, instead, if it's a tree plus a few number of, very small number of non-tree edges, then we imagine that there's only a small part of the graph that is hard. Everything else is like very tree-like, it's very easy. And it turns out this intuition is correct. And a uh, uh, reduction like that um, ends up working. Now it turns out that if we solve SSP on a graph of um, this size, where we we go we go down by some sufficiently large polylog factor, then the recursive call the the sizes, uh, the recur, recur the total size of the recursion calls over the levels do not go down. Um, here, log to the four n is the right is the right uh, number of polylogs to use because the number of recursive calls will be log to the four. And each si each uh, recursive call will have size n to log before, and this multiplies to just m, so the recur recursion sizes do not blow up. Okay, so the final recursive algorithm looks like this, where we start off with SSP, we reduce SSP to log n calls of transshipment, which calls once of this routing. Which calls once L1 uh, which call which makes one call to L1 embedding, which makes one call to ultra sparsification. Essentially, we're, we're instead of L1 embedding this graph, we're in L1 embed as ultra sparsifier. The L1, the ultra sparsifier, this recalls requires by Borgen's embedding, uh, log squared n calls to um, SSP on this ultra sparse on this ultra sparse graph, which can be reduced to SSP on a much smaller number of vertices and edges. Okay. 
So open problems. Um, one interesting open problem is to improve the, the poly log factor in running time. Cur cur uh, currently, it's very large. It's like at least log to 20 um, because there's just so many steps in the recursive algorithm. Perhaps in the quest to reduce number of poly logs, we might, we might develop better on deep, a deeper understanding between the problems of SSP and what I, what I call the continuous relaxation, the transgender problem. Another interesting direction to take is, what about exact SSP? Currently, uh, so this has seen some exciting recent action as well. Uh, currently, the best known is now near linear work and roughly square root in time. And this also works for directed graphs. And that's it. Thanks for listening to the talk.